Welcome to Sattva Project. Uh, Dr. Ian Baker, uh, one of our advisors. Uh, we are going to start this interview with an uh, open mind and open heart. So Dr. Ian Baker is a Himalayan and Buddhist scholar and author of seven books on Tibetan cultural history, environment, art, and medicine, including The Heart of the World, The Tibetan Art of Healing, The Dalai Lama Secret Temple, and the forthcoming Tibetan Yoga Secrets from the Source. He is a fellow of the Explorers Club and was recognized by National Geographic Society as one of seven explorers for the millennium for his ethnographic and geographic field research in Tibet Sampo Gorje and his team's discover of a waterfall that have been the source of myth and geographical speculation for more than a century. He is an executive board member of Himalayan Consensus Institute and works internationally as a consultant and lecturer in, in environment and cultural heritage conservation. From 2013 to 2016, he worked for London's Wellcome Trust as curator of an exhibition of Himalayan art entitled Tibetan Secret Temple, Body, Mind and Meditation in Tantric Buddhism to which he contributed both film and photography from Bhutan and Tibet. Additional information is available on his personal website, www.ianbaker.com. Very welcome, Dr. Ian Baker. Thank you very much. And I should just say, uh, after that very kind uh, introduction, just to update it, is that my website mm. is kind of, um, let's just say, suspended. I mean, it's there. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And so people, I think, can they can access it, but it will probably just say it's under under under, construction. Uh, under revision, under reconstruction. But okay. it has both my, you know, the email that's connected to the website, which is just ian at ianbaker.com, or I think I also put uh, ianbaker108 at gmail.com, and people are welcome to contact me on either of those. So that's just a, you know a little update, and also I should say. The another update from that, uh, what you read from, mm -hmm. is that the, the, my book, um, Tibetan Yoga, which was originally to be titled Secrets from the Source, was uh, retitled by the publishers, mm -hmm. um, uh, Tibetan Yoga pra uh, Practices and Practice Principles and, and Practices. Practices, and that actually was published uh, now in 2019. So that's 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 out and available and. Uh, but as you said, I will. I am working on another book now, which is forthcoming, and um, and that will be trying to look at. I think some of what we're discussing today, or how do some of these really sometimes esoteric aspects of Buddhism, yes. how how do they become applicable, applicable and relevant um, in our contemporary lives, which are so different from the way these kind of practices emerged in medieval. India yes. and and yes. the very isolated world of of uh, of Tibet uh, and the Himalayan yes. kingdoms. Well, I'm overwhelmed to be here uh, in front of you and uh, be willing to and able to do these kind of questions to you. So let's start very smoothly. Like uh, mm -hmm. we already know, Dr. Ian Baker, that you are a brilliant academic and that your works and books on the Himalayans and Tibetan yoga are just simply amazing. But behind that, there is a Ian. So who are you? What brought you into yoga studies and why yoga? Okay. Well, I should say that, yeah, in a, whatever my academic um, <laughs> hat is, you could say, uh, that aspect was really something that came later for me my primary interest in buddhism and let's say tantric yoga all of these things was very much um began with personal interest and then personal immersion uh mm. because of and then it was only later that i thought it would be interesting and useful um to gain a certain kind of critical perspective on the practices that I had been immersed in while living as I did for decades in, in Nepal and the Himalayas mm. and, you know, long retreats and all of that. So just to explain a little bit of that, I, I had the great fortune to go quite early on in this, in the 1970s to, to Kathmandu, where I met my, you know, who became my great teacher, Chattar Rinpoche, actually his, uh, 
Yeah, you can see a photograph of him yes, on the wall. Yes, very clearly, yes. Yeah. So anyway, he was a very extraordinarily inspiring. And I still remember, you know, so vividly, I was only 19 at the time when I met him. But it really was a life-changing meeting because I just felt, okay, this, this is something I can relate to. And, uh, and it was like meeting, you know, I often describe, well, what was he like? He was like meeting Merlin, you know, kind of like a wizard because, <laughs> you know, this wasn't a monk. It wasn't, a, you know, an abbot of a monastery. You know, he was in a retreat hut and, you know, with this long beard and the, the you know, the white and the red robes. It was just something so mar magical for me. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the way that he, you know, the, so the connection that I had through that was uh, because at that time I was very much involved in mountaineering and climbing. And that's actually what had originally drawn me to the Himalayas was the, the mountains and uh, the mm -hmm. prospect of, you know, losing myself in the high uh, Himalayan world uh, rather than Buddhism in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, so I became quite fascinated. I was also an artist at the time. I was doing a lot of painting. And uh, so I started to learn uh, Tibetan scroll painting. And uh, I went up into the mountains uh, to, to study with a, with a teacher there. And what I found fascinating was that although that was very prescriptive, how you would actually outline and paint a, a Buddhist deity, there was a lot more of creative license uh, in painting the surrounding landscape. Mm. And so there we were kind of in his workshop, I'd look out the window, you know, the windows and there were, you know, these huge Himalayan peaks. And um, I also saw in some of the work that he'd done, there were these amazing images of waterfalls with caves behind them and, you know, really like lost worlds. And um, so I became very intrigued by what the symbolism was of, you know, all of the, the landscape symbolism that was a subtle, you could say analog to the to the deity. So you'd have wrathful deities that had wrathful landscapes, and you'd have peaceful deities with very pacific um, mm -hmm. landscapes. And so I was very interested in that. And then uh, then he started. He told me about this tradition of hidden lands, Bayu, you know, of yeah, um, uh, which which I you know sounded imaginary. And yet he's no no no. These are very real, very hard to get to. They're over. You know, you have to climb. You know. So that, of course, captured my imagination entirely. So then when I went back to Kathmandu and met with Chatur Rinpoche, after that, you know, I asked him about these hidden lands, the Bayu, because I had actually heard that he himself, you know, had, had been to one of these places. And he looked at me, and this was sort of just the beginning of, of this very, on one level, unconventional at the same time very deeply traditional relationship guru disciple to relationship because it was very very individualized and personalized and so rather than answering my question he said can you spend a month alone and i said yes he goes well when you have a month free please come back and see me and i'll send you to a hidden land to a bayul and then you won't have to ask me what they are you'll know for yourself so that was this challenge that he set for me and it was my in some ways, back door into the Buddhist practice. And I wrote about a lot of that in, uh, in the book that you mentioned, The Heart of the World, A Journey yes. to Tibet's Lost Paradise, which was really begins with my apprenticeship, you could say, when he sent me to a series of different caves to do a series of different kinds of practices that mm -hmm. were really about, um, you know, firsthand experience. They were you know, when we think of Buddhism, and which is what's so wonderful about the Sattva project that you're that you've initiated, is you know how do we make all of this relevant to our lives? We have all, so many different categories of Buddhism now: the three turnings of the wheel, even four by some counts. Yes. And how, what what do they have in common? How are they different in terms of how they're practiced? And you know what kind of different you could say psychological um dispositions are sort of associated with each of these so in any case in my case since you asked me you know what sort of drew me to these practices yes. it was the high mountains it was the wildness of these places and i think chapter Rinpoche saw that you know in me mm. as a 19 year old mm. and so basically just sent me off to wild places and you know and um and so that began a relationship basically and then I would come back and he'd ask me what you know experiences I had and this and that so the whole teaching and the unfolding was based upon uh, uh, feedback between what I experienced 
and then he would give me kind of a new assignment and a new sadhana uh, that was both on the one hand existential because it would involve going off to these remote places and on the other hand it was you know it, it was following the traditional course of Vajrayana Buddhism which has its mm -hmm. own set of, of, of uh, sequence of practices yes. and um, so that was really what drew me in was was the magic of the Himalayan uh, landscape and ecosystems mm -hmm. uh, my initial interest in in the art um, and um, and then through that into into actual practice and that practice being inseparable from a relationship with with a with tantric master. buddhist master yeah very good but why why the yogas because we see many things in your books related to expeditors research uh, um, secret uh, aspects and lands uh, the mm -hmm. veil as you mentioned but also we see a lot of yoga uh, going yeah. deep into the yoga so why why this Dr. Ian. Why, now that very particularly because, you know, as we know in Vajrayana Buddhism, um, it's um, generally for those who may not be familiar with it, it has sort of two divisions. You could say the creation mm -hmm. phase, the creation stage, where you're working very actively with the imagination and visualization and actually mm -hmm. imagining yourself as a tantric deity, as an embodiment of wisdom and compassion. And then you have these completion stage practices which follow that in which you actually are using uh, rather than the imagination you're working more with sensation and more with a kind of just uh, internal awareness uh, that mm. you cultivate you move through the system of, of chakras and you know the nadis of the body in order to awaken um, a kind of wisdom that is actually embodied within us it's always there and we can access it directly, but the yogas are specifically designed in order to bring increased um, awareness of mm. that inner, those inner qualities. And particularly in the Vajrayana, which in a certain sense represented a, and we think of Mahayana Buddhism, it's great emphasis on the one hand on emptiness, uh, in other words, sort of just the relative nature of phenomena, but also mm -hmm. on compassion. Uh, uh, as a uh, the bodhisattva vow, so the sattva, you know, this idea that you you know you work your your practice is for the benefit of all beings. So Vajrayana even takes that a step further, mm -hmm. and the whole idea, let's say, in earliest Buddhism, which is dukkha, you know, which is this sort of unsatisfactoriness of life. And if we look at Sanskrit, you know, the opposite of dukkha is sukha. It's the happiness. Okay. It's this bliss. It's this that overturn you know if there's sukha there's no dukkha so the idea if, if dukkha is the fundamental the first noble truth that life is characterized by dukkha mm -hmm. the, you know the very bold move you could say of Vajrayana buddhism the third turning of the wheel was to say well mm -hmm. the, the great antidote to, to dukkha is sukha so this emphasis on cultivation of bliss is so important in the completion stage of Vajrayana. And it's important that it's the completion stage, not the development stage or the creation stage, because if you just cultivate bliss from the outset, you know, it, this is not lead to sort of wisdom and insight. Uh, it can lead <laughs> to, to great inflation of the ego and yes, yes, ab yes. abuse of, uh, of uh, power and, and also just a kind of inflation of desire rather than actually a moderation of desire. Because the real beauty, even in our, you know, in English language, bliss when there's bliss, there's actually no, there's no desire because you've already, it's been eclipsed. Desire is always about subject object. Uh, yes. Bliss has no subject object. It's a state of awareness. And so it sometimes, you know, in English, bliss sounds a little bit you know, trivial, but, you know, when we look at it in its subtle manifestations in Vajrayana, it's a very powerful uh, self-transcendent state of awareness. Uh, yes which is not just empty in a nihilistic sense, but is actually mm -hmm. has this, this feeling tone, you know, of what we would have, let's say in our European tradition, you know, it literally ecstasis. In other words, ecstasy, which is to step out of the self is already a self transcendent state. But if we had only ecstasy in the, you know, the way the ancient Greek cult of Dionysus or something, you know, this can get a little bit out of hand. Mm 
So this yes, beautiful yeah. idea of Ajayana being characterized by bringing the, the realization of emptiness or open spacious dimension of being combined with self-transcendent states of awareness that are inflected by a state of, of, of just pure and uh, uh, pleasurable feeling and awareness is, is really uh, what the completion stage yogas are about. So I thought these are also generally considered the most sort of hidden secret of, uh, or they have been historically. They're, and there's something we'll talk about. It's just more and more, it is coming out of the box in a way. Mm. And I think usefully, because I think, you know, we've reached a stage in global human civilization where, you know, it just doesn't really kind of work to, um, and that there's also a, you could say, a, hopefully a maturity to allow certain practices to be uh, actively engaged with, uh, without the kinds of yes. so-called dangers that were that they were perceived to have. And I would say, especially within Buddhist monastic contexts. So we have to really understand that a lot of the secrecy developed because these were practices that were not appropriate for monks or nuns. Yes. Because they I could... was going to precisely ask you this, since we are entering already into this, the secret mm -hmm. aspect, mm -hmm. I would like to ask you about uh, exactly about this. Why? What is your opinion on the secrecy and the question of secrets in Vajrayana tradition? You were precisely mentioning about monasticism. Can mm -hmm. we please go on this? Absolutely. Well, if we Thank really you, look actually. at you know these yogas in the Vajrayana mm -hmm. tradition as they developed in India and then were were introduced you know from the eighth century and particularly from the eleventh century onward into that, um, they developed within this sort of the Siddha culture, the Mahasiddhas. The Mahasiddhas mm -hmm. were these great you know they're sort of eighty five canonized siddhas who were great mm. adepts male and female who and there were mm. certainly many more but there were 84 who became particularly famous and they were all incredible sort of individuals whose own you know who may have had they may have been priests they may have been abbots of monasteries they may have been kings they may have been um sorceresses or anything but who who basically discovered that that realization that awakening enlightenment was actually something that happened uh, right in the middle of, of, of their, the heart of their own life and existence, that which was most. Um, and so there are famous examples, like probably the most famous of these so-called Mahasiddhas was Saraha. Mm -hmm. And Saraha had been a priest, essentially a, a renunciate. Um, but he recognized that he, you know, that his practice wasn't really going <laughs> mm -hmm. where it was meant to go and so he ended up marrying a the daughter of an arrow smith mm -hmm. and he famously said in one of his songs of realization only now am i truly a monk mm -hmm. and what he meant by that is not that he was a monk in the in a in the sense of having uh renounced a uh, life but actually whatever qualities you're meant to achieve through that renunciation yes, he yes. discovered not in renunciation but in integration and in intimacy and so the beauty and the power of all the mahasiddhas is that they're the they're all based upon intimate relationships both with the passions of their life uh in terms of vocation and activities but even most particularly they're they're for the most part all partnered uh, figures whose um, you know whose realization was dependent upon the the recognition that we don't live as isolated beings that renunciation yes. isn't our and denying our humanity uh, is is not really you know what we are here in this precious human birth uh, that maybe that's not the 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 Purpose. doesn't allow us the fullest exploration mm -hmm. of who and what we are. At the same time, it allows an intensification, you know, the, the renunciation, the monk nun path. Mm -hmm. It makes life to some degree, if you have that disposition, it makes life easier because there are just so many things you just don't have to deal with anymore. And you have rules to follow and you have, you mm -hmm. know, you don't, the, 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 the potential for sort of getting sidetracked into emotional entanglements and all of that should be yes. less, although we know in practice, it doesn't really work that way. Mm -hmm. um, but the point is that these the the siddhas were the same ones who introduced all these kind of ecstatic practices uh, of the, the completion stage um, into Buddhism 
you know, working with a tumo, the inner fire, the partnered sexual yogas, all of these things that worked with a kind of intensification of the energetic substrate of our, mm. of our human existence, of our anatomy. And so all of this was a bit problematic if you tried to, you couldn't really teach those things you know, in monastic settings, because it would be upsetting uh, to the whole system. So the very simple way of, you know, historically of understanding that is looking at in the early 11th century when Atisha, this great um, teacher, went from Bengal to Tibet um, to uh, teach Buddhism. And it was a time of Vajrayana Buddhism was, was very prominent, and he had a, a lot of background in that. But he said, in Tibet, if those who have taken monastic vows should not ever receive the third empowerment, which is, you know, we always think of the, the four empowerments in Vajrayana Buddhism, but the third empowerment was historically about the introduction of, of partnered sexual yoga. And through the bliss of that, and through the, the, the transcends desire, and, the rec and then that was the fourth empowerment that arose out of that was to recognize this, this state in which bliss and desire and intimacy could all exist without any kind of grasping, without any kind of possessiveness, without any kind mm -hmm. of proprietary, you know, all the things that basically bring relationships down, yes. uh, all the preparation for the third empowerment was to prevent that from happening. So that, that, and then one would recognize also that that bliss was also not dependent upon an external partner it was something yes. inherent within our own bio physiology uh mm. and that was really the pointing out of the the fourth that was the fourth empowerment which is the pointing out of this as being our own you know it, you know sahajananda the natural yes. innate state of our own consciousness is there and that these are other practices are just ways of enhancing it and they're situational they're not things that one has to seek out or depend upon when they arise, they arise and they can be worked with. But the point of all of this was to point out that the nature of the mind was not just emptiness, which mm -hmm. could veer into, into nihilism, but it's actually innately blissful. And that really, you know, brings us to, you know, the whole Vedanta view It's similar, you know, this idea of chit satananda, you know, it's just yes. being consciousness and bliss in a certain sense explains it somewhat more even access more accessibly mm. um but the point is this is why see the secrecy was introduced because it was problematic for in a monastic institutional context based on vows of celibacy yes. uh to introduce completion stage practices that relied upon an intensification mm -hmm. of blissful awareness and with the possibility of enhancing that through partnered sexual yoga it just doesn't mm -hmm. work so that all had to be kept very much mm -hmm. hidden. And as a result of it not being appropriate in a monastic setting, it just became kind of across the board considered sort of secret teachings that those even lay people who would not have been subject to vows of celibacy, for example, it just mm -hmm. became not so accessible. And also because of most of the, you know, the abbots of these monasteries that people would go to as lay people for teachings that were themselves celibate and themselves mm -hmm couldn't openly practice these practices, even if they did secretly. So the secrecy became something that was just an institutional decision in many cases, as a mm. way that these, the actual practices could be perpetuated, but without transparency and without honesty. And this is mm. why we've been led to so many of the problems that we've seen, you know, in uh, Western, you know, in Western kind of Vajrayana, where we, we, we put so much value on transparency and openness Yes. Um, and yet there was an institutional structure within Vajrayana that didn't allow these practices. They were continued, but they couldn't be done so openly. Um, and that that created a kind of, you know, psychological this this dissonance. misunderstanding. A big misunderstanding, a big yes. misunderstanding of big what misunderstanding. secret really is and what is a convenient secret, right? Exactly. Yes. And what's and what's just polite, you know, secret just simply because it's private, let's just say. Yes. Uh, private matters versus secret matters where secrets can be seen as being problematic. But, you know, there are times when privacy is, you know, private matters or not to be openly. You know, uh, this is revealed. very interesting because I remember to see an interview with you before where somebody was mentioned to you about your book and about the 
these paintings in His Holiness in the temple. And that you mentioned that His Holiness Dalai Lama said, like, oh, you are practicing this. Tibetans should be practicing this, referring to those uh, pictures, right? To those designs, to those paintings. Right. It means that is not secret at all. Well, what he literally said, and even in the foreword that he wrote, the introduction to that book, he mm. said, time of secrecy is over. Yes. <laughs> he said, more misunderstanding arises from trying to keep things secret than it does yes. from trying to explain things very, very thoroughly. Yes. So that's, you know, I had no plan to do that book originally. It was because he requested it. You know, mm. these so-called secret paintings from the murals in what mm. had been a private meditation chamber of yes. the sixth Dalai Lama. They were painted around 1700, so mm -hmm. more than 300 years ago. But they, even those are not, they're dealing with Dzogchen more than Tantra. Uh, mm -hmm. But at the same time, they are considered to be the hidden teachings because they, mm -hmm. in some ways, um, in this context of Dzogchen, they are considered so advanced that they, in other words, there's no dependency on any of the institutional structures of monasticism. Yes. Yes, and that's yes. literally why he said it's so important for Westerners to understand this level of practice, because we don't come from a cultural background of, you know, of that monasticism is the highest good or something like that. Whereas we and also the Dzogchen teachings are meant to be given on to people who have kind of an intellectual mm -hmm. uh, uh, capacity or ability to understand them without prejudice or preconception. Mm -hmm. And certainly, uh, you know, in the West, you know, when our education has served us in many ways, even if, if secular education yes. at least mm -hmm. allows us to see things in comparative perspective without, you know, ideally without bias and yes, preconception. Yes, yes. And then we, in, the, in that, in doing so, we can see the power and relevance of Dzogchen, you know, the so-called great completion practices, which is what arises out of what, you know, we were talking about as completion stage practices mm -hmm. in which you don't even, you know, you don't have to rely upon all these so-called secret yogas. You're just, it's a direct intuition of that, you know, uh, bliss, clarity, and non-conceptual spacious awareness that is in fact the nature of our mind when we, in a sense, don't no longer identify with our, you know, yes. transient thoughts and emotions that may bring us into a swirl of doubts and you know, yes, um, in a neurotic stage. Yeah, this neurotic, neurotic stage. stage, right? Yes, exactly. Very good. So tell me, Dr. Ian Bacon, how are Tibetan forms of physical yoga different from Indian Atta yoga? What are the differences and similarities from a physical and psychological point of view? Well, if we look at the early earliest evidence you could say of mm. physical what we would think of and you know, when we think of yoga today in the western world we're thinking very much of postural yoga of, mm. of postures positions and and um you know basically asana. yeah asana it's advanced mm -hmm. stretching exercises in a sense and those were very much um what we see uh early on in tibet uh well from the 11th beginning of the 11th century we see these as um as stretching exercises that were introduced, for example, in the Kala Chakra mm -hmm. Tantra, mm -hmm. probably has the first evidence of named asanas um, mm -hmm. and descriptions of physical um, mm -hmm. yogic practices. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, uh, very interesting, that's again been kind of a hidden, that aspect of Kala Chakra has never really been emphasized publicly. And yet, you know, the forthcoming work of of uh, Niraj Kumar, I think oh, yes, yes, a lot yes, of yes. wonderful yes, new revelations definitely. about yes, the hidden, I'm, the hidden, I'm yeah. delighted. I can't wait <laughs> for yeah, to interview him. I think this. will be a great treat because the hidden treasures of the of Kala yes. Chakra. And just yes. on that note, because I've you know had a lot of recent uh, dialogue with him, and I think it's mm. it's so interesting to see how by his going back to these original Sanskrit Buddhist yes. sources, um, how many things you know, were in a certain sense, re, uh, reconstrued, you could say, for, for in a Tibetan monastic context, because it was never a monastic tradition. Yeah. Uh, and it was very much, and the six Vajra yogas of the Kala Chakra, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. very much involved physical yogas. And again, for when we have, when you think of any kind of meditative lifestyle, you know, you really need to get up and move, <laughs> you need to stretch out the limbs. Yes. So there was just very practical. And as he's explained, Mm -hmm. um, and as also other traditions in, in, in uh, 
Tibetan physical yoga explain, yes. you know, it's part of this is for self healing mm -hmm. and preventive health in the same way, the Nejong tradition, which also yes. Dr. Nita Chinang Sang teaches, mm -hmm. which also developed out of the Kala Chakra Tantra. Mm -hmm. It was both for self healing uh, and to keep yourself healthy. And at the mm -hmm. same time with added, um, if you add sort of pranayama into it, then it became supportive of uh, accessing, you could say, the sort of trans, you know, self-transcendent states of awareness. So it had both a practical as well as a spiritual uh, mm. dimension to it. So in that sense, I don't think there is initially, you know, we think of Hatha yoga in the West in, as, we're, as we're talking about Indian yoga. Mm. But these same, we also know that the Kala Chakra Tantra, the commentary to the Kala Chakra Tantra, the treatise on stainless light, Mm -hmm. from the early 11th century it was the first Indian text to ever use the word Hatha yoga. Yes. And that's, that's something very important to realize because then we realize that Hatha, which means forceful, in other words, you know, vigorous mm -hmm. yoga, as opposed to yoga, which means just opening and, and joining, you know, uh, our own consciousness to, to, to the great, you know, the vast expanse of reality, mm -hmm. uh, which can be done without force. Um, but the effortful, forceful techniques that could sort of break through the barriers. Mm -hmm. If we think of those as Hatha yoga, that was there, you know, in the Kala Chakra. So that was a text that was both a source for in, later Indian uh, Hatha yoga and certainly for the Trukor or the mm -hmm. physical yogas in Tibet. So I think at their core, there, there isn't great difference. But I think what happened historically in, in India you know, certainly from the time of the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, which is kind of the, you know, the 15th century text, which basically says in its own introduction, these were practices, physical practices drawn from the tantras that could be a benefit to anyone, uh, you know, living a householder life. And it, this is when you began to, to have the emphasis on the, sat, the satkarmas, on the purification, on the, on the just a health protocol, a fitness protocol, you could say. Um, that also had a spiritual dimension, but in a certain sense, it became uh, relevant within a secular society. And that's why I think yoga, and it was, and it was again, there was no secrecy involved at that point. Mm -hmm. So this is why, you know, Hatha yoga in the West, you know, could, could thrive and flourish to the degree that it did, you know, let's say, mm -hmm. because it was no, it, there was no, re it was drawn from the tantras, which were all based on secret initiations and Guru disciple relationship, but Hatha yoga became something that was accessible mm. to all. And that I think is very, very important because Tibet didn't go that direction. They kept it really hidden. And I think it's only been in the last couple of decades that teachers such as originally Chogyanamka Norbu mm. for others have started to recognize that, hey, you know, what we have in this, in these physical yogas in Tibet is really not much different than what's being taught down at the local, you know, YMCA on weekends and <laughs> and that everybody's benefiting from. So, you know, to kind of answer that question even further, I think, you know, Namkai Norbu uh, Rimshe, mm -hmm. from 1982, he started teaching what he called Yantra Yoga. Yantra you know, Yoga. In, in, mm -hmm. in the West. And Yantra Yoga was his um, translation of Trukor, Trukor, which is the Tibetan uh, word that Trukor literally means sort of illusory, magical, wheel, um, but yantra, meaning a kind of configuration, in this case, of the body and the mind and the breath, mm -hmm. in order to achieve a, a psychological, spiritual transformation. So in his introduction to, um, to the first published work on, you could say, Tibetan physical yogas, it's called Yantra mm -hmm. Yoga, Tibetan mm -hmm. Yoga of, of, of Breath and Movement. Mm -hmm. In the 1982 introduction that he wrote for that, which was, I mean, the book didn't come out, I think, until 2008, but he, his introduction is, is, is still um, from an earlier <clears throat> work that was mm -hmm. actually only in Tibetan language. But it's important because what he says in that is that these are practices that can benefit anyone, whether or not they are followers of Vajrayana Buddhism or Tibetan Buddhism. They bring about a state of balance within our prana, within our inner energy system, and so and, and a, a deep state of relaxation, therefore bringing the mind and the body into a state of, of, of natural presence. So this was very important because what, in a certain sense, he initiated you know, from the 1980s by teaching these practices openly mm -hmm. as foundations for 
people's everyday lives rather than as secret practices to be done only after years and years in a monastery or in a remote cave, it, shift, it shifted things. And at first he was highly criticized for it. And then in the end, it became a new norm. And now we have many different models of physical, yes. physical yoga being taught openly. Hmm. You know, we had, uh, you know, uh, Tuku Tenzing Wangyal and the Ling Chimi Institute, you know, from mm -hmm. the Bun tradition. Mm -hmm. These are also being used as, as uh, healing protocols for patients in, you know, in hospices with, yes. with cancer. Very powerful, using powerful methods that once would have been secret, but now showing that they have benefit for everyday people. Or Dr. Nita Chenang Sang's, you know, work with the, with the Nejong, you know, a more yes. accessible form that doesn't involve yes. some of the really complex movements. And then, mm -hmm. you know, there's also, you know, Tukulopsang, you know, in his own mm -hmm. work with, with Tumo and, and Trukor. Mm -hmm. And I think increasingly what it seemed, what I observe, at least in all of that, let's say taking Tukulopsang's work, for example, mm -hmm. is that he's very open about the fact that he's adapting mm -hmm. an incredible range of practices from a diverse lineages mm -hmm. to a new context of teaching Westerners in a, in mm -hmm. a, non in a, in a, in a secular world, yeah. methods that he thinks will benefit them most. So in a certain sense, it's total innovation, uh, but it actually shows the way these practices have evolved over time. In the same way that Nampanubu's uh, mm -hmm. Yantra Yoga, I mean, it's very hard, even though it's you know said that these go back to the time of Vaidochan in the eighth century, mm -hmm. uh, we're actually seeing you know, uh, postures that we don't otherwise know until the 20th yes. century through modern postural yoga of Krishnamacharya. You know, we've got the camel poses, we've got, we don't see those anywhere else in Tibetan yoga, nor do we see them anywhere else, yes. even in Indian Hatha yoga until the 15th century. So, so the degree of which creativity, uh, innovation, mm. and to some extent branding can, um, you know, is, yeah. is, is used, is, uh, is, is creative, and is part of our human, uh, you know, process. This will take me to another question I had prepared here for you. Uh, and it's just the, the right moment to do this question to you. Like, can you kindly talk about your research about the monastic reinterpretation uh, of the sure. teachings and of the practices? And if it is a good uh, word here like reinterpretation I don't know if mm -hmm. it's the proper word or not it's just the word that I found suitable according to what I have been reading on your works like yes. your research yes. on this how mm -hmm. about the monastic uh, reinterpretate and readjust it to their own convenience uh, yep. the certain kind of practice like of the tantric techniques in India for example mm -hmm. Yep. Well, I think exactly as I said, let's say, mm. you know, from the early 11th century when Atisha, mm. you know, went to, went to Tibet and essentially established this Kadampa order, which was a highly monastic form yes. of, of Buddhism in Tibet, uh, and basically said, there's, you know, this is, this is, um, you know, we don't practice Tantra, you know, this is monastic Buddhism. And mm -hmm. therefore, there's no third empowerment. Uh, there's no uh, mm -hmm. there's no partnered sexual yoga. There's none of these things that we, mm -hmm. you know, which are fundamental to to how um, uh, tantric yoga in the Tibet, in, even in the Buddhist tantras was originally presented. So that became problematic because obviously there was still going to be a yogic um, non monastic communities who would be very engaged with these practices, but it would also mean that the monastic institutions would sort of lose control of the transmission of Vajrayana mm. as a whole. They would, they would, rather than being on top, you know, mm. they would be seen as somehow or other not up to the same standard as, you know, householder yogis who might be practicing more advanced practices. So this was, you know, if we just think of it in a purely as an institutional yes. uh, context, this wasn't okay. Um, mm. So therefore, as you said, the, a lot of these advanced yogas have to be retranslated, uh, reinterpreted. Mm. And um, so for example, if there was partnered sexual yoga in the third initiation, rather than with an actual partner, we practice what they call the jhana dakini, so a wisdom consort. So it was done through mm. visualization. So you would, mm. you know, a monk who was celibate 
mm -hmm. could nonetheless visualize himself in, in union. But this was also problematic because, you know, in if you actually go back to the Theravada, which is why Theravada Buddhism has often been so critical of Vajrayana, because, yes. well, you know, a monk is not even supposed to think about women. How can you actually yes. visualize yeah. it, um, even if you're not physically involved, but you're still having, you know, going through an elaborate fantasy. So mm -hmm. this is very difficult. And so Ronald Davidson, who, you know, who's done two extraordinary books on both on the origins and development of esoteric mm -hmm. uh, Buddhism in India, and then its later Tibetan Renaissance uh, and its introduction into Tibet, talks about, you know, the most incredibly, I guess a beautiful quote from him. I can't remember it offhand, but it basically deals with the most, the monastic community had the most complex, you know, intellectual hermeneutics to try to mm. justify uh, tantric practice within the context of celibate monastic life. And it just never really quite added up. And this is why there's been, you know, so much, and this hasn't really all come out yet, but there's been so much interesting criticism, let's say from the Shaiva, mm -hmm. uh, in a very intellectual Shaiva Tantra, you know, Abhinava Gupta, same time oh, yes. as the as the you know the, the tantra loka the same time that kala chakra was appearing you had abhinava gupta with a very sophisticated tantric shaivism you know basically just talking about how these buddhists are just get caught in this intellectual trap because everything is supposed to be in renunciation <laughs> and so there's this whole which really comes back to the you know the the beauty of the sattva project how do we reconcile mm. early buddhism's uh this ideal of renunciation I mean, it's just there, it's inherent. And a lot of it, I think, is just a question of how do we look at these so-called three honors, the three vehicles, which a lot of emphasis was put in the in Tibetan monasticism to mm. integrating the three vehicles. Well, that in one level, okay, but it led to so much confusion. Rather, can we not see them as evolutions? You know, so naturally we see that there was also metta, there's loving kindness emphasized in Theravada. That point gets emphasized in Mahayana yes. when you had emptiness, which could easily veer into nihilism. So you really put great emphasis on compassion. Uh, so the metta, you know, just loving yes. kindness, which was fundamental to in Theravada, becomes really your overall modus operandi, you know, as a bodhisattva. Mm -hmm. So therefore, emptiness never becomes a form of just, you know, negation becomes you know the bodhisattva the compassion expands it and so very naturally out of that you had you know you had vajrayana which emphasized well if we're going to have compassion we're mm. actually going to and if we have a bodhisattva vow to to help you know to benefit all beings you know we can't remain within a kind of narrow monastic kind of confines you know it's there's no if there is actually pure heartedness pure mind pure pure intention, then there's actually no limit to how we express our that that compassion and wisdom, you know, in our engagement mm -hmm. with the world. And so that mm -hmm. is, you know, really the, the beauty and power and danger mm -hmm. of Vajrayana, that it was really about bliss and emptiness, rather than just compassion and emptiness, which you had really in the Vajrayana, it was about using bliss to overturn the, the dissatisfactions and, and dukkha that yes. characterizes so much of life. Um, so in that sense, and then the, again, because each of these different yanas had completely different vows, set of vows, mm -hmm. and they're, they're irreconcilable. And we've seen, you know, we've seen issues like that come up even in conferences in Bhutan, where, you know, you have monastic uh, communities who are still the, yes. you know, upholding the, you know, are the, the great, the higher, mm -hmm. the top of the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So how do they reconcile essentially the Vajrayana vows? Tantric vows, which is often you know, in contradiction to uh, mm. the Vinaya system. Yes. So yes. that, and I, so to me, in my own personal view, I, I see these as, as a natural evolution. And that if you're, and it's actually, it's not just my view, even Jamyon Kongtrul for Treasury of Knowledge is very, you know, yes. you follow each, each set of vows supersedes the other. So if you're a Vajrayana practitioner, you're no longer subject to Vinaya vows. Mm -hmm. But problem is okay you're a vajrayana practitioner but you're still a monk in a monastery that will lead automatically to all kinds of things that from our own western yes, point of view yes. completely unacceptable uh yes. transgressions that have become extremely problematic and mm -hmm. widespread mm -hmm. so on one hand we can say well that's not you know 
that's not our culture that could be dealt with they can deal with it as they want but at the same time the trouble is westerners who've become in a mm -hmm. way literally indoctrinated meaning initiated into mm -hmm. a system and suddenly finding that that level of cognitive dissonance yes. between what's said on the uh, outwardly and what's practiced inwardly becomes unsustainable mm -hmm. psychologically. Mm -hmm. And many, many, as we see, kind of Dharma casualties, people who have been traumatized by thinking that they are following the right path and at the same time following even their own guru's yes. um, instructions. And that's leading to a state where they are completely split from their own sense of 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 integrity and um and yes. self-worth so this is you know a big problem and i think mm. the sattva project you know by bringing a lot of this out um and by really emphasizing more and more the female voices uh within buddhist different schools of buddhism you know can begin to to bring uh, clarity to some of these issues and a lot of that becomes, you know, in my mind, where the big sources of tension are is, mm. is um, Vajrayana monasticism. Is it even, it, it, does it even make any sense? <laughs> That's a problem. I was going to ask you about that because we are talking here about the monastic system and the monasticism. And I was thinking to myself, in our contemporary world, in our societies, the challenges we face in our societies, uh, mm -hmm. uh, is that fit? Is this fit? Uh, is this right. suitable? Uh, mm -hmm. What is going to be the future? And besides, also a big misunderstanding we have, and I would like to ask you this question very directly, Dr. Ian. What is a yogi in your perspective? Yeah. Well, to try to answer all those questions, in some, I'll frame it by saying, I mean, really, if we go back to origins, let's just say in the Tibetan mm. context, this, you know, according to tradition, when when Padmasambhava, the great yogi, uh, mm. the Vajrayana, completely non celibate, let's just say, let's put it out mm -hmm. there, the great who brought tantric Buddhism to Tibet, you know, was a great yogi. In other words, and at the same time, he had multiple consorts, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Mm -hmm. and he established at Samye the first monastery two different orders of practice. Ones were the white robed nakpas. They were the yogis who mm -hmm. would not be subject to any kind of restrictions of celibacy. They would practice the inner yogas and that they were to be equally revered as the red robe and they would follow the tantras. Mm -hmm. Whereas the red robed monks, monastics, they followed the sutras. Mm -hmm. So a sutra and tantra were two different paths that were established already according to Tibetan tradition from the eighth century mm -hmm. as two different methods by which one could attain, you know, liberation and enlightenment in this life and express one's own qualities to the highest degree. But they, they were very, very different approaches. Mm -hmm. And those were both established as we understand, you know, from textual sources in Tibet uh, by Padmasambhava as in a certain sense, it depended on one's individual disposition and life circumstances. Were you going to follow the path of a yogi? Mm -hmm. or are you going to follow the path of a monk so if we so to answer your question that way what is a yogi yes. so a yogi in uh, the tibetan context is a uh, naljurpa so neljur which is the tibetan translation of yoga means literally neljur means to be united with the natural state of existence you know and so the with the idea being that our being dukkha we're kind of a little bit off course we're not in our full mm. uh our full embodied nature, we have somehow or other kind of gotten off course. So the idea of Neljor and the yoga mm -hmm. is to, to put ourselves back into that natural state. And so a Naljorpa, a yogi in the Tibetan is one who is united with the natural state. So yes, one, the idea being that yes, you could be a monk and be completely united with the state and you're just, you know, off in your cave or you're in your cell and you have absolutely nothing else you depend upon and you've mm -hmm. sort of transcended everything and that's perfectly possible so there's no doubt that there were enlightened you know monks or nuns who just mm -hmm. had no interest in being distracted by all of yes. the things of this world or you know having a partner all of those things that can lead to so much trouble um, mm -hmm. and um, at the same time you know there were the monks who who and nuns who you know often were in conflict with themselves because their own natural state of existence, which wasn't celibacy, uh, 
was somehow always there as a, um, and that led to, you know, as we know, so many of the kind of things we continue to see in institutional Vajrayana today, you know, where there's a discrepancy between the vows and the behaviors of, of even those at the very highest levels of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of teaching. So that really comes to the other part of your question is, you know, to what degree, you know, and most in the West, there are very few, I would say, you know, the percentage of, of Westerners interested in Vajrayana Buddhism and Tantric Buddhism who have the inclination or disposition to become monks mm -hmm. is very, very, very little mm -hmm. uh, compared to those who are lay practitioners and who are in a certain sense more interested in how they can integrate their mm -hmm. worldly life into their spiritual life, which is exactly what Vajrayana says, that samsara and nirvana are not different. They're just, it's a question of how we understand reality. Mm -hmm. And if there's this non-dual understanding, then it's about, you know, using the energy of samsara to propel our journey to nirvana. So rather than having to cut mm -hmm. off this and that and follow rules and regulations of a mm. 2,500 year old institution, one can question how relevant that would be for Westerners today who have been educated. Mm -hmm. You know, in not a, only a, for westerns also for easterns we must well yes and i guess i guess yes this you're is exactly very important right. discussion you know because in asia in in the east we have taiwan we have singapore malaysia we have so many countries with so many young people is this suitable yeah you're exactly right and i think the, the whole idea of east west as a distinction isn't really so relevant anymore we're really talking about modern and tradition yes. modern and traditional so from a traditional point of view, so many of these institutions are dedicated to perpetuating the, the lineage, perpetuating the institution, mm. including, you know, including its funding sources, et cetera. And it has a certain kind of image to maintain. I mean, this is just any institution mm -hmm. is going to be involved with that. And the question is, how much is that relevant uh, to modern uh young Society. people, especially in the West and in the East, who have been educated in a more global context of mm -hmm. you know, science and history and so many other things that were really never part of a traditional education. Artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence to begin with, exactly, which you know kind of goes beyond the Absolutely. normal creation stage practices. It's like, who are we? <laughs> so yes, we can answer yes. those you know, the whole idea of anatta, which is another, you know, funda fundamental mm -hmm. Buddhist idea of the, of the not self, but we just know mm -hmm. rather than not self, it's not that we don't exist. It's just, that we don't exist the way we think we do. And that illusion doesn't mean that things don't exist. It just means they don't, and again, they don't exist the way we think they do. And mm -hmm. so to be an artificial intelligence gives us so much insight into mm -hmm. the relative nature of, of identity and what's appropriate in one context in terms of how we image or project ourselves, whether as a tantric deity with multiple arms and heads, or whether it's as a, you know, as a, as a extraterrestrial robot, I don't know. <laughs> there are just so many ways, you know, in a certain sense that we have, you know, in the current world, and it can be confusing. And therefore, you know, to some degree, I can understand the appeal of the monastic world for those who just, and it's a legitimate to be feel overwhelmed mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. contemporary life and all you want is just the kind of the straight and narrow path be told what to do by <laughs> rules that were established 2500 years ago but the question becomes you know to what degree we want to engage critically just to take an example you know one and that again it changed over time but if we go back to the early theravada mm -hmm. which is still as it's practiced in in um thailand traditionally you know you don't eat after 12 noon but why didn't you why don't you eat after 12 noon it's because it was based upon going out at dawn before people went out to their fields to work with your begging bowl and you got food and if you in a hot tropical country didn't consume that by noon by the midday sun yes. you know you was going to have bacteria and you were going to get sick so mm -hmm. there was a practical reason for some of these regulations there was a context out of, and then the, the context is gone. We don't have that anymore. So <laughs> do we find it meaningful to just follow rules that had relevance 2,500 years ago, but have no practical relevance today? Mm -hmm. Or do we, you know, use our creative minds and adapt and at least be aware that we're following a tradition mm 
in that context, let's just say in terms of when you eat and when you don't. Of course, Tibetans adapted that and they don't, you know, they'll, they'll still have their evening meal or they'll have, you know, there are different ways in which the, the things get, get mm. altered over time. But sometimes they're altered without any uh, recognition of what the original, you know, why they're changed. And mm. therefore, you know, there's not the critical insight and awareness, which we also understand to be fundamental to Buddhism. So if we're just following things without awareness and insight, then we can't really even say we're Buddhist to me. If Buddha means to be awake <laughs> and we're just following a system without uncriti questioning, uncritically, without questioning, without awareness, then we're not following the example and the words of the Buddha or the words attributed to the Buddha since nothing was written down on his own lifetime until 200 years later. But he said, you know, weigh my words like a goldsmith weighs you know, gold and follow mm -hmm. them to the degree to which they are relevant in your own life. But, you know, that that's the bottom line. And then, therefore, th yeah, then we can go to another place from here. Very interesting. That is the question. No is no as. But for example, we realize that in the East, it's very usual. Uh, people get into a monastic system because of their financial situation. Because yes. if they are not going to a monastery or a nunnery, they will not be able to study. They will mm -hmm. not be able to have an education. So what we see is many people that have been in monasteries or that are following a monastic path. It was not by devotion or properly because they choose to, but because life forced them to that or situation and context and yeah. uh, economical aspect brought them into this uh, what do you have to say about this like where is the devotional aspect the, the dedication to the dharma and uh, all of that because yeah also you have a, so many monastics a, that then yes. they do it and now they are lamas they come and teach in the west and everything and mm -hmm. uh, it's not a question of saying that they lack devotion no it's not, nothing of that but in a sense it's like in the catholic religion you know you have many people that went to priest because it was the only way to have study and to mm -hmm. be fed yes it's exactly the same yeah only your context was different <laughs> yeah no exactly just the way in the you know middle ages in europe and the only yeah. place you could get an education was to go to the monastery yeah and so then there weren't universities you know in that sense that there there are today um mm -hmm. And actually, it, just as an aside, you know, like the first universities, like Oxford University, were very much based, they were almost religious institutions. They were so mm -hmm. based upon Christianity, yes. interestingly. Uh, so there were, you know, it was almost like a monastery, you know, to be studying at Oxford in its earliest incarnation. Mm -hmm. But yeah, certain, certainly, as you say, what we see still in the Himalayan world today and uh, is that young people are sent to the monasteries to... Uh, out of economic um, necessity and they get a certain kind of education and they are taken care of to a certain degree. Um, but it's problematic because they're not, you know, I think even in the Buddha's, uh, you know, he, he, no one was allowed to become a bhikkhu or a monk until a certain age. It had to be mm -hmm. a personal choice. It wasn't something that your parents could decide for you. Yes. But again, out of cultural adaptation and necessity that changed in the Himalayan world and you know you've got tiny little yes. you know a, a little you know little people being you know made into monks and nuns before they even you know hardly can speak uh yeah. so they are you know the on a, on a positive sense the way it would be seen from within the tradition well that's great because right from the outset they are being trained you know they are being indoctrinated as um, as Buddhists with uh, the, all of the, the values and bodhisattva orientation mm -hmm. that that entails. So from a traditional point of view, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But even as people like the Dalai Lama have done, they said it's very important that mm -hmm. secular you know, science, for example, is introduced into the curriculum of monasteries and particularly for the training of Tupu, so for so-called reincarnate yes. lamas who are going to be teachers in the future. Uh, it's very important that they their education not be limited just to traditional curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, so one hopes that that, if that's the case, and monasteries in Bhutan and Nepal and Sikkim and those places like that can begin to introduce, which they have to some degree, you mm -hmm. know, even English language or you know basic science. Um, if there's a curric, if if there's you know some degree of secular education happening simultaneously. Mm -hmm. 
then you know I think that's a positive way of using the cultural resources of of a Buddhist of Buddhist monasteries uh, to promote um, education more generally that gives more options uh, for those individuals as they grow up and then decide whether they want to stay in a monastic life or if they want to in a certain sense graduate the way you would from any school uh, so I think this is the challenge that would be put upon governments uh, within those countries um, how do you and especially if those are school age individuals yes uh, to what degree monasteries would be required how would their curriculum be adapted so that those children who are essentially in a monastic context um, have options available to them um, at a, at a critic, you know, they might turn 16 to decide that the last thing they want to do is be a monk or a nun, but if they haven't had any training uh, for anything else, they're mm -hmm. stuck. And that's a big problem. So that I think the challenge yes. there is really is the educational, the ministry of education mm. in, in countries like Bhutan or Nepal to, to begin to look at um, providing yes. yeah. practical Ed, vocational and you could say and, and a more secular education along with the the buddhist traditional buddhist curriculum mm. yeah. very good and also you may notice that in the monastic environment uh, we already have difference between uh, gender difference in in buddhism right but mm -hmm. especially in the monastic environment it is very very uh, deep we can yeah. realize it very deep the way that uh, monks are supported and nuns are supported the way monks are teached and the way nuns are teached so mm -hmm. would you like to give a word on this what do you have to say yeah I, I think it's a really important thing i mean we know that you know for example in the last 10 years you know there's so many even like uh uh i think ching Paul and others have, have put so much emphasis on trying to get the same level access to initiation and to mm. to training uh, for nuns as the monks get without the same mm -hmm. difficulty and really trying to um, in that way really support nuns in being able to advance their own knowledge uh, and training within the Buddhist traditional Buddhist system. I have a little bit of controversial perspective on it to mm. begin with, which is that you know we know from the beginning the the Buddha, we don't well we know from what was written about him or words attributed to him 200 years after he passed away that he was very resistant to actually even having uh nuns uh, yes. join the order he said this will actually shorten the life of dharma <laughs> so you know a lot of very mm -hmm. misogynist sort of yes. things they're saying but, yes. but but the point is i think on another level mm. i mean and this probably sound kind of heretical to some but you know it was a men's club you know, the mm -hmm. whole idea of renunciation, the whole idea of, that it that it offered, if we look at it in its cultural and sociological social context, mm -hmm. this was definitely a men's order. It was a men's club. And so for 21st century women to try to join a 2,500 year old men's club, why would you yes. want to do that? Why don't mm -hmm. you do something better? Why don't you recreate? Why don't you examine <laughs> every single one of the 200 and whatever 50 vows mm. of the Vinaya and say, well, which ones are relevant to us today? Which mm -hmm. ones are going to further our awakening and allow mm -hmm. us to be more creative and more compassionately engaged with mm. all beings, mm -hmm. human and, and, and non-human? How do we serve the earth? Why not recreate the whole thing according to your own enlightened vision, bringing together a council only of female uh, who want to actually do better than what the Vinaya has done for mm. today? We see its limitations. We see the power, of course, that the, the an ancient institution and the support that it gets from you know governments of Thailand and everything else. Uh, yes. But I think it, there's an incredible opportunity for incredible creativity, innovation, mm -hmm. And imagination on the part of very advanced female practitioners to overturn a system and say look we can yes. do better today yes. and the situation in the world is so different that we have no there's no meaning to yes. be kind of just adhering to 2500 year old rules for men yeah even That's because you have you have we have the 
the due, the right and uh, obligation, in my point of view, to educate future generations. So you cannot mm -hmm. go into educate future generations if you don't approach uh, issues like your body in our days. This is mm -hmm. totally not possible. Uh, so. Because you mentioned that about Vinaya, uh, when I was in the London conference in 2017 and I presented a paper about nuns and their health, uh, I mentioned about some points of the Vinaya code, uh, especially some points that uh, are just for nuns, uh, because nuns, they have more vows to, to yes. they mm -hmm. have more vows than monks. And then in those vows, there are particular items that are really, you know, like um, maybe not very suitable for the 21st century, especially for the benefit of the own elf nun. So uh, it's the kind of thing that we need to discuss very openly and mindfully, but with awareness. Uh, and I think people should, um, in our days, begin to look at their bodies and to the sexual question with naturality, because mm -hmm. uh, this is... Uh, it's not possible to go and deal with young, young people and with the future, uh, totally rejecting, repressing and all of this. This has got created so many mental sickness around. Mm -hmm. So I think it's time for us to wake up for this. So, yeah. yes, I, I couldn't I couldn't <clears throat> agree with you more. I think it's really and I think this is what's wonderful with, you know, the Sattva project, because you have nuns you've got uh, uh from diversity of lineages and traditions involved who are also beginning to critically engage with their own mm. traditions to really draw out you know what it is that uh, they feel about the possibility of reform mm -hmm. and you know what is it that for example might you know cause a particular nun in a you know in a, in a vajrayana order to that in order to to remain so what is it that actually what is the mm -hmm. choice being based upon and what are the you know what are the potential you could say extra existential challenges that are mm -hmm. away in a sense being avoided you know to what degree does that those decisions to stay within an institute within a centrally a, a male yes. institution as it was originally founded you know mm -hmm. what 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 is one avoiding uh and what is one gaining and to what degree, you know, to, we can we look at the consequences of that. Uh, yes. And um, yeah, so I think that would be a, a really important way. And I think there's also interesting, you know, I also aware of of women in um, contemporary Vajrayana uh, communities in Thailand, mm -hmm. for example. I'm thinking of the Vajra City Institute, which was mm -hmm. founded by. Uh, the, the, actually the nephew of Buddha Dasa from uh, Swan Muk, the Garden of Liberation, mm -hmm. who was a, himself a Theravada monk, but actually had a very Mahayana disposition. And his nephew, who essentially was the inheritor of that institution, but who studied Vajrayana mm -hmm. uh, under Reggie Ray, for example, in, uh, in, uh, and has brought those teachings and adapted them to a Thai context. Mm -hmm. And the different, and a lot of mostly women involved in that community, and I think they are all very much engaged in a very creative um, kind of questioning of yes. the role in which Vajrayana can serve to kind of um, bring a new vision of what Buddhism can be for the 21st century, uh, with a much more, you know, in, in a, a uh, rather than a rejection. And a, a, of of sensuality and yes. human embodiment, a, a, a you know, and a, more than just an acceptance. But how do we actually use the endowment of our own human nature yes. to actually bring more joy and and peace and love into the world, and therefore to you know, which the whole idea of Buddhism, which was from the if we if we take the four noble truths, it's a you know a journey from dukkha to the extinction of suffering and how do we bring how do we bring that about in practical terms that's at the same time uh you yes. know, works with tradition but makes appropriate adjustments and innovations uh and through the arts and sensuality so i think that would be a very by your words we can um, understand that uh, lay practitioners have huge responsibility in the future and need mm -hmm. to be encouraged uh, mm -hmm. need to understand that they can practice uh, with 
diligence they can be amazing practitioners and be involved in daily activities in society and even engaged many people has got problems to mention engaged buddhism uh, but uh -huh. I think in our times that is really necessary. We need to not only have the teachings uh, in our mind and run away from those aspects. We need to face them. That is a wonderful uh, way to practice, to face the emotions all the time uh, uh, in our daily lives and have to deal with so many circumstances like COVID-19, for example, at this mm -hmm. moment that changed our life just in one year. Yes. And then suddenly you have to adjust everything. Suddenly you have to deal with a lot of things that was not supposed to happen. And mm -hmm. you have to cancel all your things. You have to schedule again. You have to, yeah, it's the huge, uh, huge teaching on impermanence, I guess. But tell me something, Dr. Ian, uh, why are the lay and yogi traditions important to preserve uh, Buddhist practice in our modern times? Do you think does it fit in our modern times? Do you think that can be a future. Mm -hmm. I think that, well, the, to start, since you asked both about monasticism and the yoga yes. traditions, I think yes. the monastic tradition probably will continue, um, but yes. it'll become, you know, a minority phenomena. Let's just mm -hmm. say the way that Christianity continues, certainly in the Western world, and yet mm -hmm. Christian monasticism is a kind of quite rare. <laughs> um, you know, we have the Jesuit traditions and the Trappists and you know, very, you know, some even up here where I am in Scotland, there's a, there's a, a, a community of, of Benedictine monks. Um, but these are, but, you know, again, it's a sort of, um, I'm not sure how much longer it will prosper, but it's still beautiful to watch, you know, yes, in all, yes, you know, the Gregorian yes. chants, they're going around with the white robes. It's, it's a Benedictine order from a 17th century abbey that yes. has remained virtually unchanged in terms of its practices for you know a over a millennium almost um and so i think you know there's a beauty and a power to that and i think the people who used to come now of course with COVID, it's all shut down they're all in retreat um mm -hmm. but there was a, a power and a beauty to see a living institution and for those who are inclined to that for those who who find joy and uh, meaning in being able to preserve uh a ancient tradition yes. uh, in such context, I think it's beautiful. And I think it it's is. something, and then to open that up as it is in the case of these Benedictine monks mm -hmm. who are otherwise living in a, as a hermits, you know, on a, in this, their case on Sunday mass, you know, to have lay people come and be able to, to yes, witness yes. and experience directly the power of the Eucharist. I mean, it's actually beautiful mm -hmm. uh, to watch, you know, to experience that. And I've does, I've done a few times before the COVID set in. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that way um, it will continue, but I think it hopefully would continue only for those who have absolute personal Motivation. devotion to that way of life and find absolute meaning in it. And it's never done because they didn't have other options available to them. It has to be done out of a spiritual inclination and that they then in that context become examples of the power that comes in that sense from social isolation uh, as a spiritual lifestyle in which they can develop an inner life that then has this power to, you know, the same with you know, we have compassion and bodhisattva vow and in, in, in Buddhism, but we also have, you know, the Christos, which is the, you know, the, the, you know, the heart and the charity uh, that is actually inherent within the Christian tra Catholic tradition just as much. So I think that sense, I hope it will continue. There's a beauty and a power and meaning that monasteries throughout the Himalayan world in particular give to people. Mm -hmm. I think that they can serve if they are developed further though along the ways that the Dalai Lama, for example, has proposed and they become Buddhist universities, maybe the way Moral Nalanda was originally where, mm -hmm. you know, they taught sciences they taught astrology they taught medicine they became yeah they had a buddhist you know they were like catholic schools <laughs> they, it doesn't mean you only taught catholicism you taught everything else you know like jesuit what? schools are some of the best people mm -hmm. get some of the best education secular education at jesuit schools because there was a rigor an intellectual rigor to them so i think if buddhist schools if you will uh as monasteries could 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 uh take nice. a little bit of inspiration from the jesuit in uh, universities. I think that would be an interesting way to go. I think there's a lot to be said there. And as far as the yogic path, I think 
again, it depends on, uh, I mean, there's so many different levels of that. We see, for example, in the West, like um, traditions in which there's the yogic path, but let's say with attributes. So let's say Arotere, for example, you know, where, which is a high fashion, you know, Vajrayana expression. It's beautiful. There's, you know, very, very powerful transmissions. And you could say um, outer inner secret yogas that have been presented in a very mm. powerful way uh, with, an, with its own kind of aesthetic and meaning and community. And I think, um, you know, have many, many, I think, in, in some sense, almost as a Western Vajrayana, that's one of the most um, impressive um, uh, institutions, you could say. And it's mm -hmm. it's not monastic, but it still has an institutional context to it. It's yes. still based upon uh, certain vows of um, you know, how you conduct yourself, but also how you dress, et cetera, et cetera, how you mm -hmm. wear your hair. So that all, I think, still will have a place. But again, only for people who feel that that's the way they want to go. It's obviously yes. nothing... And I think more and more there'll be, you know, as my own teacher Chatra and Vishay emphasized, seems was the, you know, the Sangwan Aljur. There's the way of the secret yogi, mm. which is, in other words, there's nothing. And he used the examples of one of the earliest Vajrayana masters was Indrabhuti, you know, who was a king, you know, and no one knew that he was actually a practitioner until mm -hmm. when he died, he attained, he just turned into a photonic rainbow body and vanished. In other words, his practice was so internal that it was never even evident to anybody on the outside world. And there, and that was what he was saying is the highest practice. So, so we have these different levels. There's the monastic, there's the yogic with attributes. And then there's this, there's the hidden yogi mm -hmm. tradition where we just basically uh, bring this view of uh, non-duality into, which is essentially the Dzogchen view, which is the, mm -hmm. This, uh, the, you know, if we think of Mahayana, Anu Yoga, and Ati Yoga, we're, we're mm -hmm. talking about those same three levels. And we're also talking about the consequences of the fourth empowerment, which is basically when you've taken bliss and emptiness and the existential uh, outcome of that is just to live in a state of open presence. And we kind of go beyond all these earlier stages of mindfulness which can not only does it have the problem it has the sense of what you know the watcher which has got this subtle dualism not even subtle it's an overt dualism watch the mind watch the oh no be the mind just be yes. this be the dance of the mind and do that with joy with love and compassion mm. and openness and that's the path and therefore it's no longer about a goal it's the yeah. you know the, the the path is the goal and because if you do everything with with joy and love and you know, there's a there's meaning in the whole thing so again whether we isolate ourselves to do that and pray for all sentient beings or we dance with all sentient beings these are basically yes. the two you could say the two polarities i'd say of the the future yes and yes. sattva as you've done with your project is about bringing more clarity integrity and awareness to all of those different choices that may be some suitable for some and others and other approaches more suitable for others. Yes, it's because, you know, uh, in our days, uh, most of us, we use uh, smartphones and all of that, right? And we have to upgrade things all the time. Yes. New systems are always coming. So we need to upgrade. Otherwise, we will not be able to talk or to do video because we don't have the upgrade of the app. Exactly. So in a ironic and just quite a funny expression we can say that maybe in buddhist traditions we need to do some upgrade because yeah. other way these apps will not work for the yes. future generations because we are not talking about we are not talking same language no. we are not uh, going directly to the young people's heart because it's mm -hmm. sometimes too much philosophic sometimes too much deep they think oh i don't understand this this is too much deep or then uh too much um, strict in some kind of practice, then they get scared only to think about it. Because we, this new generation, we must realize, and I think this is something uh, important, we must realize that thing in the last 40 years, they changed so much in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you are doing video conference, you are doing everything online, banks are relying on online systems, 
who could imagine this? So how can you speak to young people and to these new generations with the same language he used 2000 years before? Right. So this is just the question uh, that uh, I think it's important to have uh, people like you, Dr. Ian Baker, and many others uh, in the Dharma, in many traditions, to bring this awareness and uh, to realize that we need to upgrade and we need to embrace the changes, not rejecting them mm -hmm. and not resisting change, because this is something very problematic, being mm -hmm. always resisting the change. And then when you try to do something and implement a new system, then you are going against the tradition or you are not respecting the tradition, all this, all that. We just need to maybe upgrade some traditions, otherwise they maybe will die. Yes, yes. Well, and especially I think in Vajrayana, so in Tantric Buddhism is often referred to as taplam in Tibetan, yes. which means the path of methods, the, te the path yes. of techniques. So exactly as you say, if we rely only upon techniques and technology from a thousand years ago or before, without any upgrade, it doesn't make any sense. It's just illogical. So, you know, we know so much more now from neuroscience and other things about how the mind and the body function, um, that there's lots of scope to begin yeah. to, to engage. If you don't, if you don't make use of this information to educate from a different perspective, how do you want to have informed uh, societies and informed practitioners? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so that's, a... yeah. So I think that's the great work that you have set up for yourself. No, 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 no. Your, your, well, I don't mean just you, but I just mean with, with Sattva, looking Everybody, at cross traditions. It's just a baby, it's just giving the first steps. And it's quite yeah. difficult because uh, we realize that bringing all the traditions together is such a huge uh, thing. It's really impressive, but I'm sure with the efforts of everybody, it's going to be yeah, positive in yeah, some way. Yeah. But I would yeah. like to do a last question, if you allow sure. me. Yeah. So what advice will you give to the young generations uh, uh, to practice the Dharma? What would be your advice? Huh. I think my advice would be, which is not just my advice, it's really the heart essence, you could say, of in the context of Tibetan Buddhism mm -hmm. is to recognize that, you know, the Buddha isn't something separate from you. It's not up on a shelf to be prayed to or devoted to. You are the Buddha, the Buddha mind, Buddha nature is this endowment of wisdom and compassion is our innermost essence. And so that we really, for a younger generation who may have been brought up in a traditional Buddhist context or else have been, been introduced to it coming out of a, you know, of a Christian and you know, a Catholic devotionalism, is to recognize that the real wisdom of the Buddhist tradition is to recognize is not to it is to recognize our own Buddha nature. In other words, our own continuum of wisdom and compassion, and that's where self empowerment comes from. Mm -hmm. So I think this is important. Just to remember that all of these complicated techniques, as you mentioned, and all of Vajrayana Buddhism, mm -hmm. sadhanas to particular multi armed deities and multi headed and this and that, it all comes down to just being able to shift from our own uh, personal preoccupations to this self-transcendent state of bliss and awareness in which we can engage, you know, creatively and lovingly with, with all of nature and all of humanity. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Hi. Dr. Ian Baker, for your time, for this kind words, for your wisdom, for sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was tempted to request you a new interview for the future about something you mentioned here that is very dear to my heart. And I think it's very important to Buddhists also, that is the Nalanda tradition. Mm -hmm. um, I would like you to invite you maybe to a next interview to talk about the Nalanda tradition and how important it was. And sometimes seems a bit like forgetting in our days. Sure. Um, it yeah. would be lovely to talk to you about that okay. if you are well, available. Let's see. <laughs> I'm sure we'll have opportunities for many more discussions. For thank, you so so thank you thank so much. Thank you so much for, no, for thank inviting you so much, me into your really. sattva mandala. No. And, uh, <laughs> thank you so much. a few ideas. Thank yeah. you. And I hope we can uh, keep in touch.